Hello, and welcome once again to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Mike Parker, and I'm the instructor for the class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures of the Restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoy this lesson, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And subscribe if you want to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. The key individuals in this lesson are Nephi, the 6th century BC leader of the people of Nephi in the land of promise in the Western Hemisphere, and Isaiah, an 8th century BC prophet in the kingdom of Judah. The outline of events for this lesson. In 2 Nephi chapter 11, Nephi explained why he included more of Isaiah's writings in his record. In chapters 12 through 24, Nephi quoted 13 chapters from the writings of Isaiah. In 2 Nephi 25 through 27, Nephi explained and interpreted Isaiah's writings by likening them unto the people of Nephi and their descendants. The setting for this lesson. Nephi wrote this portion of his record in the Nephite settlement named after him by his people. Isaiah is one of the best known Old Testament prophets. The book that contains his writings is among the longest of the prophetic books of the Old Testament. His name in Hebrew means Jehovah has saved or Jehovah has delivered. He was a prophet of the southern kingdom of Judah and part of the prophetic class of seers who dwelt in the king's court. He was called to be a prophet around 740 BC at age 20. He prophesied during the reigns of four kings of Judah and was court historian for a time. The first part of his ministry lasted about eight years, around 740 to 732 after which he apparently withdrew from public life for a time. He then became active again for 15 years, between 716 and 701. He may have died around 681 at age 79, but this is uncertain. There is no notice of his death in scripture. Tradition says he was killed by being sawed in half. Moroni, the last prophet of the Book of Mormon, encouraged us to search the prophecies of Isaiah because they contain the purposes, promises, and covenants of the Lord. Jesus Christ himself quoted the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 54 to the Nephites and then told them, And now behold, I say unto you, that ye ought to search these things. Yea, a commandment I give unto you, that ye search these things diligently, for great are the words of Isaiah. Isaiah is the only book of scripture that the Lord has commanded us by name to read. At least some of Isaiah's writings were on the brass plates Nephi took from Laban. About one third of the text of Isaiah is found in some form in the Book of Mormon. These quotations include 20 entire chapters, 15 of which were quoted by Nephi himself, 13 passages of 1 to 12 verses in length, at least 75 paraphrases of or allusions to passages in Isaiah's writings. Isaiah was frequently quoted by Nephi, Jacob, Jesus Christ, and Abinadi. The selections of Isaiah's writings in the Book of Mormon followed the translation style in the King James Version of the Bible, with differences some of them significant, 
in about half of the verses quoted. Here's one example from Isaiah 2, quoted by Nephi in 2 Nephi 12. In verse 5, the name title LORD is in small caps in the King James Bible, indicating that it is a euphemism for the Hebrew Yahweh or Jehovah. The Book of Mormon renders occurrences of LORD in mixed case throughout the text. The Book of Mormon also adds an entire sentence to the end of the verse, smoothing the transition to verse 6 by indicating why the Lord had forsaken Israel. At the beginning of verse 6, the Book of Mormon text clarifies that the personal pronoun thou refers to the Lord, not to the house of Jacob. The King James translation italicizes words that are not in but are implied by the original language. The translators use these to make the text understandable in English. The text of the Book of Mormon frequently varies from the King James in these italicized words. In this instance, the Book of Mormon introduced a subtle change in meaning. The people of Judah have become soothsayers like the Philistines are, has been changed to, the people of Judah listen to soothsayers like the Philistines do. Other than these variations, why does the Book of Mormon follow the translation of the King James Bible so closely? Shouldn't Joseph Smith have produced a completely new translation of the Isaiah material? Did he just copy the text of Isaiah right out of the King James Bible? Joseph Smith did not describe the details of how he translated the text of the Book of Mormon. However, witnesses to the translation process testified that he did not have a Bible or any other written materials with him when he dictated the Book of Mormon. Emma Smith, the prophet's wife, served as a scribe for him for a time during the translation. In 1879, shortly before her death, she testified to her son, Joseph III, quote, In writing for your father, I frequently wrote day after day, often sitting at the table close by him, he sitting with his face buried in his hat with the stone in it, and dictating hour after hour with nothing between us. Question. Had he not a book or a manuscript from which he read or dictated to you? Answer. He had neither manuscript nor book to read from. Question. Could he not have had, and you had not known it? Answer. If he had had anything of the kind, he could not have concealed it from me. Unquote. While the evidence from the witnesses is that Joseph did not have any reading material, I'm not opposed to the idea that he consulted a Bible from time to time on an as-needed basis, as an aid in the translation process. It's also possible that the Lord revealed to Joseph a text that was very close to the King James Version. The King James was the only Bible people in Joseph's world were familiar with, and it would be a natural choice for the language of Scripture. Whatever the reason, it appears that Joseph was led to translate many Isaiah passages as they appear in the King James Bible. Let's also consider the flip side of this issue. Why do many quotations from Old Testament prophets in the Book of Mormon differ from readings in the King James Bible so frequently? There are at least five possibilities that explain the variant Isaiah readings in the Book of Mormon. First, some of the writings of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon may represent an earlier version of Isaiah's text than what we have in our Bible. The Isaiah text on the brass plates would have been written down less than 100 years after Isaiah lived. The Hebrew text of Isaiah used by the King James translators and by most modern Bible translations was written down about 1500 years later. A second possibility is that the scribe or scribes who wrote the Isaiah material on the brass plates made their own intentional changes to the text. And it's a virtual certainty that they made accidental changes. Third, in our last lesson, we discussed how Jacob purposely modified Isaiah's text to support his message. In a moment, we're going to talk about the creative ways in which Nephi used Isaiah. It's possible that many of the variant Isaiah readings in the Book of Mormon are the result of deliberate revisions by the authors of the Book of Mormon. Fourth, since it's at least possible that Joseph Smith may have used a King James Bible to help him craft the English translation of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, a fourth possibility is that the text he produced 
may have followed the King James in certain places, instead of whatever reading was on the small plates of Nephi, a sort of hybrid text. Finally, as we discussed back in Lesson 2, some differences between the Isaiah text in the King James Bible and the Book of Mormon may be due to Joseph Smith's scribes mishearing or miswriting, as Joseph dictated. I don't see any of these possibilities as mutually exclusive. Any and all of them may have taken place throughout the transmission of the text from Isaiah's original writings to the brass plates, to the Nephite plates, to the handwritten Book of Mormon manuscripts, to published editions of the Book of Mormon. There are other considerations readers should also keep in mind when studying the Book of Mormon. Some differences between Old Testament passages in the King James Bible and the Book of Mormon are due to later editorial changes made by the Prophet Joseph Smith and others to the text of the Book of Mormon. One famous example that we discussed in Lesson 2 is Joseph's edition of the parenthetical phrase, or out of the waters of baptism, to 1 Nephi chapter 20, verse 1, in the 1840 edition of the Book of Mormon. This phrase was an interpretive edition that was not in Isaiah's original text, nor in Nephi's transcription of Isaiah's writings. To this, we must add Joseph Smith's later revisions to Isaiah, which he completed in the early 1830s as part of his new translation of the Bible. The Joseph Smith translation, or JST, usually follows the Isaiah text in the Book of Mormon, but it also has its own variant readings. One example is this passage from Isaiah chapter 2. Nephi's version expanded on Isaiah's original. It also swapped the sequence of the words in the underlined portion. The glory of his majesty became the majesty of his glory. The JST adopted the longer reading from 2 Nephi 12, but it also diverged from both the King James Bible and the Book of Mormon by introducing the completely unique phrase, the majesty of the Lord. So which reading is the correct version of Isaiah? I'm going to answer that by rejecting the premise of the question. There is no correct version of any scripture. Every book of scripture has gone through a process of textual development to reach the version we have today. There are earlier versions and later versions of these texts. Every copy of a text introduces differences from the version it copied from, whether intentionally or by accident. None of the Isaiah texts we have today, in the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Joseph Smith translation, the Dead Sea Scrolls, etc., represents the earliest version of Isaiah's writings. The historical study of textual transmission suggests that all of these are textual forks that adopted different interpretive readings of Isaiah to suit the needs and purposes of the translators. There is no original text we can reassemble. Rather, there are different versions that branch off from whatever Isaiah himself wrote. Each version that we do have is unique and important and should be approached on its own merits. Isaiah in the Bible should be read and appreciated, along with Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, Isaiah in the Joseph Smith translation, Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so forth. We learn unique and important things from each version. Isaiah's message wasn't just to a specific group of people at a single time. His oracles promised judgment and restoration for the people of Judah who worried about the Assyrians in the late 8th century BC, those who worried about the Babylonians in the late 7th and early 6th centuries, and those who returned from exile during the Persian era in the late 6th century. The traditional view is that the entire book of Isaiah was written by Isaiah, son of Amos, between 740 and 701 BC. Doubts that the book of Isaiah was written by a single author may have been expressed as early as the 12th century AD. Western scholars have argued since the late 1700s that the book of Isaiah was written by multiple authors who wrote to different audiences in different periods of time. At issue here is not whether Isaiah could foretell specific events that took place 200 years after he lived, but rather that the vocabulary, style, tone, 
message, and assumptions in Isaiah's writings all vary considerably throughout the book. Many biblical scholars contend that there are at least two and possibly three different authors whose works were later compiled into a single book under Isaiah's name. Most of chapters 1 through 39 is usually ascribed to the historical prophet Isaiah, who lived at the end of the 8th century BC. He is referred to by scholars as First Isaiah, Proto-Isaiah, or Original Isaiah. His writings were critical of Judah's sins and foretold a time when the Lord would judge Judah and all its surrounding nations. Chapters 40 to 55 have a message of peace, renewal, and comfort. They are strikingly different in tone from the first part of the book. The author of these chapters did not identify himself by name, but scholars refer to him as Second Isaiah or Deutero Isaiah and believe that he wrote sometime during the Babylonian captivity, 586 to 538 BC. The final part of the book, chapters 56 to 66, has a message that foretells a coming period when a humbled and contrite people of Israel will be restored to their lands in glory and the Lord will rule over them. Some Isaiah scholars believe this section was written by a third author whom they refer to as Third Isaiah or Trito Isaiah. It's believed that he wrote soon after the Jews began to return from their captivity in Babylon, 538 through 500 BC. The assertion that two or more authors wrote the book of Isaiah is so widely accepted that it's not even argued anymore, except by conservative religious scholars who are opposed to the claim on theological grounds. Pick up any scholarly commentary on Isaiah and the divisions within the book are simply assumed. Latter-day Saint scholars have been divided in their opinions on the authorship of Isaiah. For Latter-day Saints, the problem with accepting multiple authors lies mainly in that some of the writings ascribed to Deutero Isaiah are in the Book of Mormon. Using the brass plates of Laban as their source, Book of Mormon authors quoted all of Isaiah chapters 48 to 54 and a few passages from chapters 40, 45, and 55. However, according to the prevailing theory, this material was supposedly written by Deutero Isaiah after Lehi left Jerusalem with the brass plates around 597 BC. This anachronism presents a challenge to the historicity or historical authenticity of the Book of Mormon. Partly for this reason, many Latter-day Saints have rejected multiple authorship of Isaiah and have affirmed that the prophet Isaiah wrote the entire book himself in the 8th century BC. Another approach some Latter-day Saints have taken is to accept that there were multiple authors of the Book of Isaiah, but to push back the portions of Deutero-Isaiah that appear in the Book of Mormon to before 600 BC. In other words, the chapters quoted in the Book of Mormon were written before Lehi, but chapters not found in the Book of Mormon, 41 to 44 and 46 and 47, could have been written after Lehi during the Babylonian exile. Ironically, in some ways, the Book of Mormon may support the theory of multiple authorship for Isaiah. Some scholars believe that Isaiah chapter 1 was written by Deutero Isaiah. Isaiah 1 isn't found anywhere in the Book of Mormon, and Nephi's long quotation of Isaiah material in 2 Nephi begins with chapter 2. If Isaiah chapter 1 was written after Nephi left Jerusalem, then it would make sense for him to begin quoting from what was, for him, the start of Isaiah's prophecies on the brass plates. Additionally, outside of a few possible allusions, none of the material ascribed to Trito Isaiah, Isaiah chapters 56 to 66, is quoted or paraphrased in the Book of Mormon. This may indicate that the final portion of the Book of Isaiah was not on the brass plates and was in fact written by a later author. Whether or not one believes the book of Isaiah was written by more than one author, it's important to recognize that most ancient scriptures are composite works of original authors, as well as later editors and redactors. As Professor Hugh Nibley pointed out, quote, what we have in Isaiah is a lot of genuine words of the prophet intermingled with other stuff by his well-meaning followers. Every chapter, including those in Deutero and Trito Isaiah, 
contains genuine words of Isaiah, and every chapter, including all those in the early part of the book, contains words that are not his." Unquote. Having laid that extensive groundwork, let's now look at how Nephi used Isaiah's writings. Nephi had at least three purposes for using Isaiah. His first purpose was to prove the truth of the coming of Christ. He wrote, that I might more fully persuade my brothers to believe in the Lord their Redeemer, I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah. My soul delighteth in the words of Isaiah, he wrote, for he verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him, and my brother Jacob also has seen him. My soul delighteth in proving unto my people that save Christ should come, all men must perish, for there is none other name given under heaven whereby man can be saved. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children, and also our brethren, to believe in Christ, and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved, after all we can do. And we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies, that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. My soul delighteth to prophesy concerning Christ, whom Nephi taught, cometh in six hundred years from the time that my father left Jerusalem. Nephi's message that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, was directed to both Jews and Gentiles. Nephi's second purpose in using Isaiah was to reveal the covenants of the Lord. As we read in Jacob's teachings last week, the people of Nephi saw themselves as a people who had been cast off. So he used Isaiah's prophecies of the gathering of Israel to comfort them. Nephi did rehearse unto Laman and Lemuel the words of Isaiah, who spake concerning the restoration of the Jews or of the house of Israel. And after they were restored, they should no more be confounded, neither should they be scattered again. After quoting and interpreting Isaiah 29, Nephi taught, that the Lord would proceed to do a marvelous work among the Gentiles, that I may remember my covenants, which I have made unto the children of men, that I may set my hand again the second time to recover my people, which are of the house of Israel. His third purpose was to warn all people about the judgments of God. Nephi explained that one of the reasons he quoted 13 chapters of Isaiah was so that his people and his children as well as all those that shall receive hereafter these things which I write, may know the judgments of God that they come upon all nations because of their wickedness. Nephi applied Isaiah's warnings to the people of Nephi, as well as to the Lamanites and to Jewish and Gentile readers of the Book of Mormon in the last days. Nephi wrote that Isaiah spake many things which were hard for many of my people to understand, but Nephi delighted in plainness, so he left us four keys to help us interpret Isaiah. These keys are found in 2 Nephi 25, verses 1 through 8. His first key is to learn the manner of prophesying among the Jews. This includes, among other things, learning their history, culture, beliefs, language, and writing styles. How did Hebrew prophets convey the Lord's message to their own people? Nephi promised that the words of Isaiah are plain unto all those that are filled with the spirit of prophecy. So his second key to understanding Isaiah is to obtain the spirit of prophecy. Obtaining the spirit of prophecy starts with gaining a personal witness of Jesus Christ. For, as an angel told John the Revelator, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Later in the Book of Mormon, Mormon tells us that the sons of Mosiah obtained the spirit of prophecy after much prayer and fasting. The prophet Moroni taught that the spirit of prophecy is a gift of the spirit. Apostle Wilford Woodruff likewise taught, it is the privilege of every man and woman in this kingdom to enjoy the spirit of prophecy, which is the spirit of God. Nephi's third key was to become familiar with the regions round about Jerusalem. This means learning the geography and geopolitical history of the kingdom of Judah, its capital city, Jerusalem, and its neighboring states, Israel, Edom, 
Moab, Egypt, Syria, Assyria, Babylon, etc. If we understand the region and political situation in which Isaiah prophesied, we'll understand his words much more easily. Nephi's final key was to live in the last days, for in that day they shall understand Isaiah's words, wherefore, for their good have I written them. This last one is easy. You've already done it. Let's next examine how Nephi used Isaiah. Four times Nephi explained that he reinterpreted Isaiah's writings to apply them to his own people. In 1 Nephi 19.23, he explained, I did read unto Laman and Lemuel that which was written by the prophet Isaiah, for I did liken all scriptures unto us, that it might be for our profit and learning. In 1 Nephi 19.24, he exhorted his wayward brothers, Hear ye the words of the prophet Isaiah, which were written unto all the house of Israel, and liken them unto yourselves, that ye may have hope, as well as your brethren, from whom ye have been broken off. In 2 Nephi 11, verse 2, before quoting 13 chapters of Isaiah's writings, he declared, I will liken Isaiah's words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children. He then told his people in 11, verse 8, Now these are the words of Isaiah, and ye may liken them unto you and unto all men. It's important to keep in mind that Nephi explicitly stated that the interpretations he applied to Isaiah's writings were not intended to reflect Isaiah's original meaning. Rather, Nephi gave them new meaning by applying them to his own people. Let's look at an example of this by reviewing Nephi's interpretive reading of Isaiah 29, found in 2 Nephi chapter 27. Let's first examine Isaiah's original meaning behind his prophecy. The prophecy is divided into three sections. Section 1, Isaiah 29, verses 1 through 8. Jerusalem would be besieged, and many Jews would be killed, but the Lord, Jehovah, would protect them. Verses 1 through 3. Isaiah called Jerusalem Ariel, which means a sacrificial altar hearth. Jerusalem was like a sacrificial altar because of the destruction that would take place there after foreign nations besieged her. Verse 4. The dead people of Jerusalem would speak from the underworld as ghosts. Verses 5 and 6. Despite this, the foreign nations that attacked Jerusalem would become like dust or chaff, because the Lord will destroy them with earthquakes and other natural disasters. Verses 7 and 8. Eventually, it would seem to the people of Jerusalem as if these invaders had been a dream of a night vision, something they only imagined. Section 2, Isaiah 29, verses 9 through 16. The wicked people of Judah would ignore Isaiah's warning because they were spiritually blind. Verses 9 and 10. The Lord gave the people over to spiritual blindness as a form of punishment. Verses 11 and 12. Isaiah's revelation was like a sealed scroll. When he shared it with learned men, they refused to open the scroll. When he shared it with unlearned men, they told him they can't read. In other words, no one was paying attention to Isaiah's prophetic warnings. Verses 13 and 14. The people of Judah had the outward appearance of righteousness and piety, but inwardly they didn't really honor the Lord. Because of this, the Lord promised to do something amazing that would shock them all so much that they would be speechless. He would tell them what that amazing thing is in the next part of the prophecy. Verses 15 and 16. This part of the prophecy concludes with a warning that those who tried to hide their plans from the Lord were as good as dead. The Lord asked rhetorically, if a created thing is better than its creator. Section 3, Isaiah 29, verses 7 through 24. The Lord's amazing, marvelous work would be a renewed Jewish society. Verses 20 through 21. Isaiah prophesied that a time was coming when his sealed, unread scroll from verses 11 and 12 would be read, but it would not be read by tyrants, by those who did wrong, or by those who bore false testimony or perverted justice. Verses 18 and 19. Rather, the scroll 
would be read by the deaf, the blind, the downtrodden, and the poor, people who were formerly the outcasts and oppressed in Judah. Verses 22 through 24, he prophesied that a new Israelite society would arise that would honor and respect the Lord, one that would have true understanding and insight. The prophecy in Isaiah chapter 29 was especially important to Nephi because it gave him hope that his descendants, even though they would be destroyed, would still play a key role in the restoration of the gospel and gathering of Israel on the last days. He reinterpreted and reapplied Isaiah's words in 2 Nephi chapter 27. Nephi explained the setting for his prophetic interpretation in 2 Nephi 27. Verse 1, in the last days there would be a universal apostasy, with all men being drunken with iniquity and all manner of abominations. Verses 2 and 3, at that day the Lord will bring natural disasters upon the people. The wicked will fight against Zion, but their supposed victories will only be imagined. Like a hungry man who dreams he is eating, or a thirsty man who dreams he is drinking, they will wake up and be unfulfilled. Verses 4 and 5. The people in that day will stumble spiritually because they have rejected the prophets. Verse 6. At that day the Lord shall bring forth the words of a book, and they shall be the words of them which have slumbered. Verses 7 through 14. The book Nephi saw will be sealed by the power of God, hidden from the world, and seen only by witnesses specifically chosen by God. Note that there is no matching passage in Isaiah 29 for 2 Nephi 27 verses 7 through 14. Nephi interjected his own prophecy into the middle of his interpretation of Isaiah. Verses 15 through 18. The words of the book will be shown to someone who is learned, but he will refuse them because he cannot examine the book for himself. Verses 19 through 23. The words of the book will then be given to someone who is unlearned, who cannot read them. The Lord will give him power to read the words, after which he will be commanded to seal up the book again and hide it up unto the Lord. Verses 24 to 35. The bringing forth of the book by the unlearned man will be the start of the Lord's marvelous work and a wonder that will lead to a spiritual outpouring on the world and an ushering in of God's messianic kingdom. Isaiah's phrase, a marvelous work and a wonder, had a profound effect on Nephi. He used it five times to describe the restoration of the gospel in the last days. Nephi's interpretation reapplied Isaiah's prophecy to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon in the last days. The unlearned man is, of course, Joseph Smith, who translated the Book of Mormon and then restored the Lord's church and kingdom to the earth in the last days in preparation for the second coming of Christ. Book of Mormon prophets Lehi, Nephi, and Moroni all used Isaiah's prophecy of people speaking out of the dust like a ghost as a metaphor for how the writers of the Book of Mormon will speak to us in the last days, even though they are long dead. This is an excellent example of how Nephi personally applied the scriptures to himself and his people. For Nephi, the scriptures were not just something to be read and understood, they were to be internalized and applied. One final thing. There's something interesting in Nephi's use of Isaiah in 2 Nephi 27. It includes what may be the earliest recorded reference to Joseph Smith's first vision. Nephi declared that the Lord shall say the words of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 29 verses 13 and 14 unto him that shall read the words of the sealed book. Nephi's prophecy that the Lord shall say Isaiah's words to Joseph Smith was fulfilled in the statement Jesus Christ made to Joseph in the first vision. If 2 Nephi 27 verses 24 through 26 is indeed an allusion to the first vision, it is the earliest recorded reference to it in Joseph Smith's revelations and writings. 
With Isaiah's prophecy of the marvelous work and a wonder as his launching point, Nephi next applied Isaiah's words to his vision of the great and abominable church. We'll discuss that next week, along with Nephi's prophecy of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon in the last days, his teachings on the doctrine of Christ, and his final testimony. The reading for next week is 2 Nephi chapters 28 to 33. If you enjoyed this lesson, please click the thumbs up button to give it a like and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes, this slideshow, and the handout for this lesson. Thanks very much.